did his medical school and neurological residency at Columbia University, which is uh, which is a college north of here, um, or at least from where I'm sitting, some renown. Um, and since and after doing a peripheral nerve fellowship uh, as well as a pain fellowship, uh, he's been uh, growing in prominence over the course of the last 20 to 30 years in the field of peripheral nerve uh, neurosurgery. He served on uh, just about every editorial board and every national committee you can think of um, while developing one of the busiest and um, most academically uh, progressive um, peripheral nerve practices and functional practices uh, in New York City on the East Coast and, and in the country. Um, he uh, is also quite a character, as you can tell by his his drapes. He, he's a very interesting man <laughs> and is certain to give a give an excellent talk. Um, and I've been lucky to know him for the last five years. And I look forward to what he's going to uh, teach us about peripheral nerve injuries. Okay. Thanks very much, Chris. I'll stop the sharing there. So you should be able to share, Dr. Winfrey. Perfect. All right. So thank you, Pat, uh, for that introduction and for Chris Kellner and Zach Hickman for the invitation as well. Um, we're going to talk about peripheral nerve injuries. And I know this is a trauma audience uh, and there may be some ER uh, providers here. And so what we'll do is talk a little bit, just basic nerve structure. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of too much biology here. We kind of left that in the rear view mirror with med school, hopefully, but some of it's relevant to what we're going to talk about. We'll talk about the diagnosis of nerve injuries some class of ways to classify nerve injuries. And then we'll get into the nerve injury mechanisms because it's the mechanisms of nerve injuries that really help us uh, treat these appropriately because it's all about the timing uh, and how we actually do the, the peripheral nerve repairs. And in the end, we'll wrap up with some examples of peripheral nerve emergencies because a lot of peripheral nerve surgery, it's, it's sitting around waiting for the nerves to recover, but there are some actual urgencies and emergencies that need to be addressed in a certain time frame to ensure an optimal outcome for the patients. And so I think for this audience, it's helpful to know that. Uh, and it's much more important than sort of the details of the exact type of surgeries we do to treat these patients. So let's get into it. Nerves have a structure like anything else in the body. There's a tough outer covering called the epineurium. And then there's these fascicles inside, each of which contains hundreds or thousands of, of axons, each wrapped in uh, myelin, for the most part, and some endoneurium, which is a connective tissue that nobody cares about. And then there's some blood vessels. So the nerve itself, the outer covering, the actual structure of the nerve, there's the myelin and then the axons. And that's what you sort of need to really keep in mind. So when you're seeing somebody with a suspected nerve injury, I mean, you're basically being a doctor, right? It's the history, you do a physical exam, potentially electrodiagnostic studies, depending on the type of nerve injury and the acuity of it and then diagnostic imaging. And it's imaging that's really transformed the, the practice of peripheral nerve surgery over the past decade. In the old days, like before a decade ago, like when I trained uh, 20 years ago, it was all about the history and the physical exam and the electrodiagnostic studies. And all the decisions were made based on that. And a lot of times we were wrong, but now we've got imaging where we can actually see what's going on with the nerves. I mean, picture neurosurgery before CAT scans, right? You were doing pneumoencephalograms and kind of getting these indirect studies, trying to look at brain and pathology and just making educated guesses and doing exploratory stuff. And that's where peripheral nerve surgery was a decade ago. Now it's not. We use imaging, just like if you break an arm, you get an x-ray before doing any sort of bone fracture treatment. Same goes with nerves. So the history, still important. The when sort of the timing of the injury. Was this a year ago? Was it a month ago? Was it an hour ago? The where, what part, what body part was injured? What nerve was potentially injured? And then how, what's the mechanism injury? Was it sharp? Was it dull? Was it a chainsaw? Was it a gunshot? You know, that sort of thing. So all this is, is fairly important and very quickly discernible from a glance at the patient, a quick, you know, two second conversation, or maybe just looking at an EMS, you know, intake sheet. Physical exam is kind of what most people already no, I mean, obviously there's a more detailed peripheral nerve examination to really get into it. Um, and it's sort of beyond the scope of this talk, but we, we assess motor function by, you know, this sort of MRC, the medical research council grading scale, zero to five. Most of you should be familiar with this. Um, inspecting the person, do you see atrophy? Like in this case, deltoid, you see supraspinatus, infraspinatus atrophy. Um, and then you can see uh, sensory loss. You can, you know, determine that. And, and again, this is, 
this is a two minute exam. This is not, you know, necessarily a, a prolonged detailed sort of thing, but you can get a pretty good idea pretty quickly what nerves are involved by looking at what muscles are involved and what the pattern of sensory loss. Electrodiagnostic studies are relevant once you're, you know, three to four weeks out from the injury. These are not done acutely and really shouldn't be done acutely. Um, really ever. Uh, this is an example of a nerve conduction study. So there's two parts of electrodiagnostic studies, nerve conduction studies and the actual needle EMG where you stick needles in the muscles. The nerve conduction studies give you some sense of amplitude, which is how many axons are functioning within a nerve. So when you see an amplitude drop, that means there's been a dropout of axons. So there's axon loss. And that's often from an injury upstream from where you're measuring. Because if there's injury at where you're measuring, you're probably not going to see anything. So this is an example of a patient with an ulnar neuropathy with conduction velocities that are high, and then they drop really sharply at the elbow, and then they get normal again on these inching studies. Uh, conduction velocities are a reflection of how efficiently the nerve is conducting. So the faster the nerve conduction is, the more efficient the myelin is. So when you injure a nerve and you knock out or degrade the myelin, your conduction velocity is slow. So that happens with milder injuries, more severe injuries knocks out the axons. So abnormalities of conduction velocity and amplitudes give you some indication of sort of where and, and to what extent the injury is. The EMG tables where you stick the needles in the muscles and you get fibrillations. And here we see deltoid, biceps, and infraspinous affected. So that's a fairly classic upper trunk brachial plexopathy. And so I, as a peripheral nerve surgeon, I can't really give a talk like this without showing a picture of the brachial plexus. So C5, C6 forms the upper trunk. When you knock out the upper trunk, you lose deltoid, biceps, so you lose shoulder abduction, elbow flexion, and you lose supination, so your arm is pronated, right? So the arm kind of hangs at the side in this waiter's tip position. A lower trunk plexopathy, C8T1, lower trunk, kind of knocks out the hand. Shoulder and proximal arm, tricep, all that are fine, but you lose hand intrinsic function, and you sort of get this claw hand, and that's what happens with a lower trunk plexopathy. So once you do all this basic sort of history, physical um, exam, electrodiagnostic studies if possible, diagnostic imaging is next. And so a bunch of different imaging modalities, which is true for neurosurgery in general. X-rays can be good. If patient has a radial neuropathy and they got a spiral fracture, you know, that's helpful. Um, if a patient has a neuropathy after an orthopedic procedure, it's helpful to see what they did because maybe there's some hardware over the nerve or alongside the nerve. This is a patient with a gunshot wound. This is obviously a CT scout view. But again, it's good for looking at sort of trajectory of the bullet, fragments, uh, the actual bullet itself. You can kind of see what potential nerves are involved. CAT scans are better, uh, more detailed soft tissue injury. This is the same patient with a gunshot wound. You can see the entrance on the opposite side. You see the tract all the way through, right along the brachial plexus, and then it shatters the bone here and the bullets under the skin. So again, for detailed anatomic planning, CAT scans are usually better. MRI, though, shows better soft tissue anatomy. Here's a patient with a brachial plexus hematoma with obvious compression of the brachial plexus here. So MR imaging is great too, especially the high resolution MR neurography. So MR neurograms have really transformed the practice of peripheral nerve surgery. It's basically an MRI that uses bigger magnets to get higher resolution. So here is a mid-thigh MRI of the sciatic nerve. Here's the femur. Here's the sciatic nerve, this little blurry smudge here. Now here's the almost exact same cut in a you know, different patient, but here's an MR neurogram done here in the city uh, showing much higher resolution. You can not only see the sciatic nerve clearly, you can see the blood vessels, you can see the individual fascicles within the nerve and much more detailed anatomy. And this is the standard of what I use for diagnosing peripheral nerve uh, injuries and other neuropathies. Here's a coronal view showing a really nice view of the sciatic nerve all the way from the you know, spinal level all the way down into the proximal thigh. You can see the blood vessels and you can obviously see how this would clearly show neuromas or entrapments or injuries or whatever. And I'll show you some examples of that later. Diagnostic ultrasound is also very helpful. Uh, shows really magnified views of nerves and a great way of looking at injuries. It's also faster and cheaper um, than, than an MR neurogram. It's usually more accessible. And it's often in a lot of hospitals too, where neurography is usually only at subspecialized centers. So here's an axial view of a nerve showing the fascicular architecture, same with the longitudinal view. Really nice way of looking at nerves. So let's talk a little bit about injury classification. Uh, the, the most effective one we use is from Seddon from 1943. It divides nerve injuries into three classes. There's the neuropraxia injuries, which is where the nerve is structurally intact. The axons are not broken. The epineurium is intact, but the, the the nerve doesn't conduct an impulse. 
either because there is edema in the nerve. So picture you smash your finger with a hammer, but just not too hard. The finger swells up, it hurts to use, doesn't really work so well. But after a few days, the swelling goes down and then and the finger goes back to normal. That happens with nerves with mild injuries. They get edema, they stop working, the patient has numbness or weakness, but then it resolves after a few hours to days. We've all slept on an arm or a leg funny and had this happen. That's a neuropraxia. Some neuropraxies though involve degradation of the myelin, which I mentioned before. So when the myelin degrades, that takes about six weeks to recover. So some neuropraxic injuries recover after minutes or hours or days. Some take six weeks to recover. But those are all class one. Class two is where you have more severe degrees of injury, either compression or stretch or whatever, that it actually breaks the axons. When the axons break, they undergo Wallerian degeneration and they die off. And those axons, even though the nerve is otherwise intact, the connective tissue and all those tubes where the axons used to live, they're all intact. Those axons can regrow and they regrow at a rate of one millimeter per day, which translates to about an inch a month or a foot per year. So axonomatic injuries actually take months or years to recover, depending on how long the nerve is. Those are all class two injuries. And those injuries tend to get better on their own and don't need surgery. Neuromatic injuries are where the nerve is actually transected. And, um, you know, this bottom thing is not a neuromatic injury. The neuromatic injury is, that's just to show the Willerian degeneration. Neuromesis is where the nerve is actually cut. The nerve is physically torn apart or sliced apart into multiple pieces. So those will not heal on their own without surgery. Another way of looking at nerve injuries is to actually classify them based on mechanism. Um, so you have the acute compressive nerve injuries. So these are things like hematomas that are crushing a nerve or, um, you know, a suture around a nerve, something where a, a patient has this compressive lesion and they've got a significant neurological deficit, that's an acute compressive nerve injury. So we'll talk about that as a separate category because those are uh, uh, peripheral nerve emergencies. And we'll get into that in a bit. The sharp lacerating injuries are important uh, because they're distinguished from the blunt lacerating injuries because they're managed a bit differently. And these are all different than the incontinuity nerve injuries, which is where the nerve has been injured, but it's still in one piece, not divided. Right, so a class two injury. And then there's nerve root avulsion injury, which is the most extreme form of nerve transection where the nerve is actually ripped out of the spinal cord. So the acute compressive nerve injuries are generally best treated emergently. These are one of the few emergencies we see in neurosurgery. So this is a patient, maybe it was in a car accident or had a fall. Let's say they're on anticoagulation and they've got a big brachial plexus hematoma. And, um, and they'll say they've got a substantial neurological deficit. I mean, this is just like other elements of, or areas of neurosurgery. If you have somebody who presents the ER with a, say a seven millimeter subdural and they're asymptomatic, you're probably not gonna operate on them, right? But if they become symptomatic, then they're going to probably get surgery, right? They develop a drift or hemiparesis, you're gonna wanna operate on them. Same goes with this. If you've got a patient with a, a compressive lesion involving the nerves and they've got a significant deficit, they should probably get surgery. Now, mild deficits, you can, sort of weight on, but if someone's got a weak arm or they're a paralyzed arm and they've got a brachial plexus hematoma compressing the plexus, you got to decompress them emergently. Other compressive lesions, this is a, uh, an example of a traumatic AV fistula uh, from a penetrating injury. If you have one of those, they're probably A, going to need some sort of vascular repair to address the fistula, but if that fistula is compressing the nerve and causing a significant deficit, it probably needs to be decompressed as well. So you probably do the vascular repair and then take out the mass lesion. And this is true for pseudoaneurysms as well. Again, you repair them, then you can address the mass lesion. You don't want to sit on a profound neurological deficit with an acute compressive lesion. And that's just a general tenet of neurosurgery. So here's an example of a patient with a brachial plexus hematoma. It's very obvious. These things are not subtle. And she had a paralyzed arm. So of course, we took her right to the operating room and evacuated the clot. Now, if she had the same thing, where the imaging showed a hematoma, but there was no deficit and it wasn't obvious, we don't operate on those. It's gotta be a significant deficit and it's gotta be a pretty obvious lesion. Sharp lacerating injuries conceptually are the most straightforward. These are where the nerve is cleanly divided, usually by a razor blade, or in this kid's case, a carpet knife, um, something that cleanly divides the nerves without traumatizing the ends too much. The indication for these is, it's not really emergently, but urgently. You have basically 72 hours to operate on these things. You operate on them as soon as you can uh, within that three-day time frame. It can be the next morning or the day after, it's fine. You know, if you, you don't have to run in at two in the morning and do this. 
But basically, the goal here is to get an end-to-end -end anastomosis. You stitch the ends back together in a tension-free fashion. And so the longer you wait after the injury, the more the nerve ends retract and the harder it is to pull the ends together. And if you have to pull the ends together under tension, your repair is going to probably break down. So, But if you get a good repair early on, there's a 90% chance these sharp lacerating injuries can recover. So here's an example of a patient that had orthopedic surgery and uh, they were hammering a chisel to do something. The chisel slipped and went deep and actually transected the sciatic nerve, the perineal division sciatic nerve. So here's an MR neurogram showing the sciatic nerve in a coronal section on the left side. And you see the tibial division deep is fine. You see this notch taken out of the perineal division. So this person woke up from that surgery with a foot drop. They got an emergent MR neurogram and then transferred the patient to me for repair. So that was the appropriate management for that. This is a different uh, patient who was, said he fell on a butcher knife. Uh, he fell out of bed onto a butcher knife, but the knife wound is only about a half inch in length. So I knew that was a BS story. So turns out I met his wife and uh, they both fessed up that the wife stabbed him. Anyway, transected his sciatic nerve. So again, we didn't wait around. We took him to the OR the next morning and did a primary repair and end repair of the sciatic nerve. So again, conceptually very straightforward. And about three years later, he made a really good recovery. This is that facial nerve kit a year out, and he's got about a 90% recovery of his facial nerve. You know, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. He can eat, he can close his eye, he doesn't drool, and he was very happy. So these injuries, if you get to them quickly, actually do really nicely. Blunt lacerating injury is a little bit different. It's also a transection injury, but the bluntness, so think chainsaw blades, propeller blades, jagged metal from a car crash, bovie injuries in the, in the time of surgery. These type of injuries actually traumatize the nerve ends. And when you traumatize tissue, it devitalizes the tissue and that tissue will break down over the next few days to weeks. So if you do a acute repair of a bluntly transected nerve, chances are your anastomosis is gonna break down. So the recommendation is to actually wait a few weeks, you know, three to four weeks, and then go in, uh, then clean up the ends of the nerve, and then either do an end-to-end -end repair if, the, if you can bring the ends together or do a graft repair. That way you are anastomosing healthy nerve ends together. The thing is though, when you do a graft repair, the outcomes for, you know, a good outcome is about 50% down from 90% with a direct end-to-end. -end. So if you can do a direct end-to-end, -end, you're better off. Imaging can be helpful in these cases because um, you have time, right? You're not seeing someone in the OR taking them right, or seeing someone in the ER going right to the OR. You actually have time to get imaging. So you can often see uh, transected nerve with these neuromas that are separated. And here's what it looks like in, in real life. And it, you know, the ultrasound is a really good way of looking at these. MRI will show you the same thing. So what you do is that, you know, um, a month later, you go in, you trim off the neuromas, you get back to clean, healthy nerve tissue, and then you stitch in a graft or a series of, of grafts to, to bridge that gap. What we've been doing recently is where patients have nerve gaps and we can't bring the ends together. What we've been doing is actually shortening the extremity. I mean, not really the extremity, but bending the extremity to shorten the nerve and then splinting them in place so that we get an actual direct end-to-end -end anastomosis, but we lock them in knee or arm flexion so they don't rip the anastomosis apart. And over a two month period, you gradually straighten out the extremity. And so when you do that, the nerves will actually gradually lengthen and you can actually get much better recovery than if you did a graft repair. It's kind of neat. Incontinuity nerve injuries are where the nerve is damaged, but it's not been transected. And so this does um, a couple things. One is it can cause scarring in the nerve. And sometimes that scar is not so bad. And sometimes what happens is those axons will then grow through that scar and reinnervate your muscles and sensory organs distally. Now that takes time, that takes an inch a month. So it may be a years long process. Sometimes though, those axons get hung up in the scar and are unable to reach their destination, right? And so just looking at a neuroma, you can't tell visually which one is which. And the reason it's important is because they're treated differently and the outcomes are different. If we let the nerve recover, the outcome's different than if we do a graft repair. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. So when you have a patient with an incontinuity nerve injury, you generally wait a minimum of three months to allow that person to recover. That allows the neuropraxic injuries to recover and the demyelinating injuries to recover because you don't wanna operate on them. You want them to just recover. So your three months, gives you a time frame to let all those uh, patients recover and not get operated on. So let's talk about some of these mechanisms. So the incontinuity nerve injuries are typically the stretch injuries. A lot of things you can do to stretch a nerve. You can 
you know, flex the neck one way and um, and depress the shoulder. You can hyper abduct the arm or shoulder and that stretches the nerves across the, the, the humeral head. You can have stretch injuries on an extremity that actually damages the nerve inches or even a foot away. So for example, if you have an inversion ankle injury, you can actually rupture or stretch the perineal nerve of the fibular head, you know, a foot away from the actual injury. So be mindful of that when you're assessing these patients, not all nerve injuries are at the site of the musculoskeletal injury. They may be at an area further away where the nerve is fixed where it branches and it can't glide. And that's where the nerve will be affected. Compression injuries can occur. The classic one is the Saturday night palsy where you get drunk, you go out and you have your arm slung over a chair and it compresses the radial nerve. I see about one of these every couple of years. So it's a real thing. Uh, doctor, you know, physician surgeons can put retractors on nerves. You know, you see, you know, small incisions, you get nerves in the area and you get retractors in the area. You can see how it's, it's not a stretch to imagine, you know, a lot of these nerves getting compressed by retractors. Um, injection injuries occur, uh, people getting vaccines, people getting nerve blocks. Uh, we see it with anesthesia sometimes. These are can be direct nerve injuries where the actual drug is injected into the nerve. Those are the worst. That usually causes this horrible bolt of lightning pain. But patients can also get injection injuries from, from blocks where the nerve is not directly injected, where the nerve is just bathed in local anesthetic. Local anesthetics can have toxic effects on nerves. Why some people get affected and some don't, it's unknown. But even with ultrasound guidance, um, you know, you, you, where you, you make sure you're not actually injecting the nerve, people can still get block injuries and it's a chemical burn to the nerve, not an injection injury. So that's important because it's not malpractice. It's just a bad, you know, the patient has a bad reaction to the drug, but it's not the doctor's fault. Electrical injuries are horrible, often massive soft tissue loss. Electricity will travel on the skin. It'll travel along the high resistance stuff along the bones and it'll heat up and burn the, 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 the extremity from within. I don't, I've really not seen these. They're, they're rare and they're, you know, the patient often loses the extremity, but in theory, these can cause nerve injuries, but it's not real common. Gunshot wounds, you probably do see some of this. Hopefully you see, you're seeing mostly low velocity civilian injuries. This is the exact same injury. Just this is a civilian sort of handgun type thing where you have a through and through low velocity bullet. And this is a military type or hunting, you know, 30-06 or a 30 caliber where you have a big cavitation injury that just blows the soft tissue apart. Obviously, these are going to injure the nerves in, in sort of different ways, uh, but it's not usually about the bullet. It's about the cavitation injury. And so what happens, let me show you this video just to illustrate cavitation injury. When a bullet hits tissue, it slows down. And so all that kinetic energy, one half MV squared, right? So the faster the bullet goes, it's, it, it, it really exponentially increases the amount of energy available. As the bullet hits the tissue, it slows down. That kinetic injury is turned into heat energy, which vaporizes the tissue. So the tissue turns to gas or steam and it blows apart. And so this is a high velocity, 30 caliber assault rifle being fired into water. So you can see the bullet exits the muzzle in a supersonic way, and then it becomes subsonic. So you see the difference between a high velocity round and a low velocity round, the cavitation injury is dramatically different. And so when this happens inside someone's body, you can see how it can have fairly remote effects on the tissue. So you have this cavitation, the collapse, this re-expansion, it really is disruptive. It can really ca cause nasty injuries. So you have a patient with an incontinuity nerve injury, you really wanna image it. So you got time, you can do your electrodiagnostic studies, you can get imaging. Here's a colorized ultrasound showing an aroma, and here's what it looks like uh, in real life. Here's a brachial plexus MR neurogram showing this big, nasty neuroma here in the plexus. So what's nice about this is you get to see exactly where the problem is, and you can plan your surgical strategy accordingly. There are times where I'll get imaging and it shows the neuroma to be too extensive, so more than like eight or nine centimeters, I won't even bother repairing the nerve because I know if I have to excise that big a neuroma and have that big a gap, a graft repair is not going not gonna to work. So a 10 centimeter graft, 12 centimeter graft, it's probably not going to be effective. So this actually helps sort of screen out patients that are not going to benefit from surgery. So I mentioned this before, the issue with these incontinuity injuries is some of them are recovering, right, where the axons are growing through the scar and some aren't. So we need to be able to tell the difference. Now you might say, why don't you just do a graft repair in everybody? It's because graft repairs have a 50% chance of good recovery. Whereas if the nerve is recovering on its own, it's got a 90% chance of good recovery. So that's a big difference. So if we grafted everybody, we're gonna condemn a lot of these people to a bad outcome. 
So what we do is we can actually tell electrically who's recovering and who's not. So we only graft repair those that aren't recovering. And we do that by performing nerve action potential recordings in the operating room. It's basically just a nerve conduction study that the neurologist would do as an outpatient by putting the electrodes on the skin, but we put the electrodes on the nerve after we surgically expose the nerve. And we do this for incontinuity nerve injuries. The way it works is you surgically expose your neuroma, then you stimulate above with one electrode and you record below with a second. And here's your stimulation artifact. And if you have a flat tracing, it means no signals getting through. That person's not recovering and that neuroma gets excised. All right. And then we do a graft. And this is the other reason why you wait three months, because you need time for the axons to grow through here. So you need a couple of inches of nerve here to test so you can have uh, some data that makes sense. Because if the, these electrodes are too close together, all you just get is artifact. So you need three months of recovery to enable this test to happen. For patients that are recovering, you stimulate, you get a stimulation artifact, and then you get a nerve action potential. And when you see that, that means signals getting through and we don't graft those nerves. We leave those nerves alone. And here's what it looks like in practice. Here's an aroma, we stimulate, we record, here's your stimulation artifact, and then here's our nerve action potential. The, uh, the team here does it like 10 or 12 times just to make sure it's real. That's why there's a whole bunch of these lines and they just put them together. So this is a recovering nerve action potential. So this person would not get a graft repair. This, however, is a stimulation artifact and a fairly flat tracing. There may be a little nub here, but it's really not significant. So when you have a flat tracing, you excise the neuroma and then do either a graft or some sort of repair. Like I said before, the end-to-end, -end, if you can get the extremity shortened. So a lot of times though, we have to actually harvest sural nerve. Here's a patient with a sciatic nerve gunshot wound that we were prepared to harvest both sural nerves if we needed. So you can harvest sural nerve as much as you need and then you bring in as many grafts as you need to do the repair. And then you just stitch them in. And then you um, and then you wait. And you wait, you know, a year or two or three, depending on how long the nerve is. And there's about a 50% chance they'll get a good recovery. There is some data recently that shows that some of these synthetic nerve, they're not synthetic nerves, it's actually cadaveric nerve that's been processed to get rid of the cells and the tissues, leaving just the connective tissue uh, membrane, those little tubes that the axons live in. Those are still in here. So we actually use these to do nerve repairs. And they've been shown to be just as effective as sural nerve autograft up to five to seven centimeters. So for short gap nerve repairs, we've been using these uh, pretty exclusively. So anyway, there's data to support the use of that. So not all patients need grafts, autografts. Root avulsion injuries, these are the most extreme type of transection injuries, usually happen in the context of a very violent injury. So motorcycle accidents, most common cause, ejection from a car. I've had patients who've had tree branches fall on their shoulders. And what it does, it puts a severe traction load on the brachial plexus and it rips the roots out from the spinal cord. And what you see on imaging, this is a CT myelogram showing, here's the normal side where the, the rootlets are in the cervical spine. Here they've been ripped out of the spine here and you have this empty nerve root sleeve called a pseudomeningocele. We've actually stopped using MR neuro. I'm sorry, we stopped using CT myelography. Now we just use MR neurography for these patients. But the bottom line, it shows the same sort of thing. These are obviously not reconstructable. When you rip a nerve root out of the spinal cord, you can't really stick it back in the spinal cord. I mean, people have tried, it doesn't really work. So what we do, um, since obviously doing a graft repair is not going to work either, we have to do nerve transfers where we bring healthy nerves from unaffected muscles and you plug those into some of the damaged nerves. And so here's some examples. Um, when you have somebody with a paralyzed arm, say for example, with a, with a flail arm where the entire brachial plexus is ripped apart, what you do is you bring in nerves from outside the brachial plexus, like the accessory nerve, for example, and you plug them in to try to get shoulder abduction if you can, or you can bring other nerves in to establish arm flexion. And there's other transfers that can be done for arm extension and finger and wrist and pinch, but we won't get into that. Um, so shoulder abduction is best uh, recovered with an accessory to suprascapular nerve transfer. So here's the back of a person's shoulder. The accessory nerve runs underneath the trapezius muscle here in the back of the neck and shoulder. So we can cut that nerve distally and swing it over and plug it into the suprascapular nerve uh, to actually reanimate the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. That can help the patients recover shoulder abduction and external rotation of the shoulder. And that's a real helpful movement. Further shoulder abduction can be recovered by plugging a branch of the triceps uh, muscle from the radial nerve, which is right here in the back of the arm. You plug that into the axillary nerve and that can help reanimate the deltoid. This is obviously not gonna be done in the context of a flail arm, 
but this would be done in the context of an upper trunk brachial plexus injury where the middle trunk is still intact. So all you're doing is harvesting one or two of these triceps branches, plugging into the axillary nerve and it reanimates the deltoid. The Oberlin transfer is where we actually take a fascicle of the ulnar nerve. This is in the proximal medial upper arm. We take a fascicle of the ulnar nerve, we dissect it out, and we actually plug it into the biceps branch of the musculocutaneous nerve. This is for somebody with a paralyzed bicep. You can actually take one of your wrist flexor fascicles and plug it into the biceps branch. And over three to six months, you actually get biceps function. It's pretty cool. So here's an example of a patient with a flail arm, totally paralyzed after nerve transfers, they can abduct the shoulder and they can flex the arm. It's obviously not perfect, you know, um, but it, the arm can serve as a helper arm. They've got some movement, so, you know, it, it does help. And what it also does is doing these transfers actually helps uh, nerve pain. So a lot of times these nerve injuries cause severe pain syndromes. And when you do these transfers, you can actually help the patients uh, get recovery of their, of their pain. So let's kind of wrap up with a uh, discussion of some peripheral nerve emergencies. And this won't take very long. And then what we'll do is have time at the end for questions if people have any. So when you're seeing a patient in an emergency situation, like either as an inpatient or in the hospital, in the ER, you know, whatever, um, you need to sort of figure out what needs to be dealt with now and what can be dealt with in a delayed fashion. So I mentioned before the acute compressive lesions with a significant neurological deficit. Those are neurosurgical emergencies. And they should be dealt with accordingly. So here's a patient that underwent some sort of, I don't know, vascular stroke. I don't remember exactly what it was. It could have been a thoracic outlet decompression or some sort of um, line placement. It doesn't matter. But they developed a big postoperative hematoma afterwards. And we got this MRI, I was compressing the brachial plexus and they had a weak arm. So obviously, you know, this patient, it's near the neck too. So obviously airways a concern here as well, although it wasn't really on the airway. So this is obviously somebody who took to the operating room right away and decompress. That's not something you're going to sit on and say, well, let's see it, see if how it gets better. Let's see if your hand gets better. Just go in and take out the clot. Don't worry about it. It's just pretend it's an epidural in the skull and treat it the same way. This is a little bit different, a little bit more nuanced. This patient actually underwent, you know, a healthy patient underwent a knee arthroscopy for, for something and they woke up with a foot drop. Now, historically, these patients are just told, well, it'll probably get better and just go home and we'll wait on it. Well, with modern nerve imaging, we don't need to do that anymore. So this patient actually woke up with a foot drop and was sent for an MR neurogram. And what it showed is here's the perineal nerve coming down behind the knee. And here's a suture that's around the nerve, right? So this is obviously not a patient you're going to sit there and say, well, let's bring you back in two months and see if you get better. This patient has an acute compressive lesion and they got a foot drop, right? So that person goes back to the operating room same day and you take out that stitch and you reestablish the, the, uh, the function of that nerve if you can, um, you know, by taking the pressure off of it. That's not somebody you're going to sit on. And having these advanced nerve imaging techniques, whether it's MR neurography or ultrasound, allows you to make these decisions. Now, obviously, if this patient woke up and had no deficits, you wouldn't do anything, right? You would just, you'd watch them. Of course, they wouldn't have got the imaging study. You'd probably never know about it. But if they've got a deficit and they've got an acute compressive lesion, you take them to the operating room. Patient I showed before with a gunshot wound, uh, a traumatic AV fistula with a neurological deficit, that person gets a repair and you operate and you resect this mass lesion, right? I mean, it's sort of just basic neurosurgical common sense. Again, this is that person with the uh, transection injury. Um, again, th this does not have to go in the middle of the night, like some of the other stuff potentially. This, we waited till the next day. We got the patient in the OR. I got a good night's sleep. And then we spent three hours under the microscope stitching his nerve together, right? So acute compressive lesions, sharp transection injuries go right away. Pretty much everything else, stretch, compression, gunshot wounds, everything else waits, right? because of all the reasons we talked about. You want to give the nerve a chance to recover. You want to give the remyelinating injuries a chance to recover. You want to give the, the, um, the, the, the nerve edema injury you know, time to recover because they may just recover after a few days. And then you want to give the incontinuity nerve injuries time for the axons to recover so you can actually test them appropriately with NAPs three months down the line. So today we reviewed uh, some nerve structure, some nerve injury diagnosis, couple different ways of classifying uh, nerve injuries, the, the sedin classification, as well as the, the mechanism classification. And then we review the different nerve injury mechanisms. And the importance of that is that the diagnosis and treatment of these is different 
based on really the, the treatment is different based on the mechanism. Some you do right away, some you wait, and some are in between. And then we talked about the different peripheral nerve emergencies. This is a part of the talk where I usually thank my family and how wonderful my kids are. But my kids are little shitbirds and um, they're just awful little creatures. And so this is their way of saying hello to you. This is how they say hello to me every day. And so my advice is don't have kids. So that's it. That's my talk. I hope everybody uh, learned something and I'm happy to uh, take questions if there are any or chats or, or whatever. Awesome. That was great, Dr. Winfrey. I appreciate it. I love that beard. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if anybody has any questions, uh, either just raise your hand and I can uh, promote you so you can uh, ask away or either or just put them in the chat. Um, but I had a couple of questions for you. You know, um, obviously, we don't have uh, MR neurograms here at, uh, at, at Elmhurst and, and whatnot. But like, what, what Tesla magnet is that? Three. Three. Okay. I mean, you can get an MRI and just, yeah. you know, you tell the radiologist, you know, get T2 sequences, mm -hmm. uh, uh, angle the gantry so it's parallel to the nerves. So you can actually see a long segment of the nerve instead of just an oblique, you know, cut through the nerve. Um, you know, there's different things they can do to optimize your nerve visualization on these imaging studies, even with a traditional MRI scan. Um, but if you've got somebody with artifact, like hardware artifact, like you really need some of the more modern Dixon sequences to suppress that artifact because you can actually see nerves right next to hip replacements and things pretty clearly with the right sequences. So ultimately, if you have somebody that you suspect an acute, you know, compressive lesion or transection injury, you can always transfer them out to get imaging mm -hmm. um, at, either at HSS or you can always call me. We can transfer them in if you need to, or just do the best you can with the imaging you have. Like an ultrasound may mm -hmm. tell you what you need to know. Like, yeah, the nerve yeah. transected, in which case then you don't need to send it anywhere. You just, just take yeah. care of it there. So yeah. ultrasound is great. That can address most nerve injuries that are not like inside the pelvis or inside the chest. You know, most extremity nerve injuries, you can see just fine with an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a musculoskeletal person or a radiologist who can do a basic nerve ultrasound, I mean, that's kind of, you're 90% there, right? Mm -hmm. It's the 10% of the nerve injuries that are sort of outside, like under the clavicle or, or really proximal next to the spine or in the pelvis that are out of reach of ultrasound, you know, yeah. but those are going to be few and far between, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. And, and what about, you know, in those acute compressive lesions, how often would you say like neurosurgery or you are being called at the time of the compression or it's kind of like after the fact when like, you know, um, you know, particularly for like a um, hematoma or something. So I'd say it depends on the, on the yeah, hospital. Yeah, like yeah. I took 11 years of trauma call out at St. Joe's in Patterson, yeah. New Jersey. Yeah. And I almost never got called even for like, there was one time where they were wheeling a patient into surgery with a slash wound to his, to his medial thigh. And I literally stopped the patient mid train. I, I open up and I look and I say, Hey, can yeah. you, can you um, feel this? And I touched his, and it was clearly a femoral nerve transection. And everyone's just like, Oh, we got to go in and, and stitch the wound up. And I'm just like, you guys, I mean, you're, you're the third busiest trauma hospital in the country and you can't recognize a basic nerve. It was, it was crazy. So I'm telling you, this stuff is out there. And I know that wasn't a compressive injury, but there are all these nerve injuries that are out there that people aren't recognizing and addressing. So to answer your question, how often do I get called? Almost never. It's It's mm -hmm. gotta be pretty obvious. Even at my institution, I mean, I saw a patient not long ago who had a sharp transection injury of the lower leg that was sent to me six months after the fact by the neurologist because the ER just, you know, they saw the, diagnosed the injury, sent it to ortho. The patient never sent it, followed up with the ortho. Ortho saw the patient eventually, didn't do anything about it. It was way outside the window and nothing mm -hmm. happened. So, you know, a lot of people drop the ball. It's not just ER. I mean, it's everybody. I mean, people mm -hmm. just aren't paying attention to the nerve and nerves in, nerve injuries. And so that's why I give talks like this. So people are aware of this stuff and they can call neurosurgery when there's nerve involvement with a significant deficit. Now, if there's a hematoma and there's no deficit, then you know nobody cares about that, right? Um, at least from a nerve perspective. But if the person's got a deficit, they've got a hematoma or something compressive, it needs to be addressed, right? Mm. And it's a judgment call if it's a mild deficit. Like if somebody has, you know, four out of five weakness and they've got a compressive lesion, and let's say they're coagulopathic and they're sick and you high risk for surgery, yeah, okay, there's some wiggle room. You don't have to operate on everybody, but but at least have 
you know, neurosurgery involved to make some assessments, get imaging. I think that's prudent. Yeah, great. Um, anybody else have any any other questions? I don't see anything in the, the chat. Everybody's being very quiet. My general rule <laughs> is if the patient, the patient has yeah. an injury, like if there's some trauma, yeah. whether it's surgery or a fall, or any sort of accidental, a traumatic injury of some sort with an unexpected neurological deficit, okay? That person has to see neurosurgery or at least has to have some sort of neurosurgical evaluation, okay? Could it be spine? Sure, it could be spine, it could be anything, but a neurosurgeon at some point should be involved. Now, that doesn't mean a neurosurgeon has to come in at two in the morning and see every patient with a new deficit, but at some point, maybe the next day, a neurosurgeon should be involved. Like if you do a if patient has a knee arthroscopy and they wake up with a foot drop, unless ortho is prepared to deal with that nerve problem, and a lot of orthopedic departments are, right? There are a lot of orthopedic departments that have hand surgeons that can do this, that's fine. I mean, as long as there's a nerve person involved, but if a patient has a surgery or an injury or something, and there's an unexpected neurological deficit, my opinion is that person needs to be evaluated by either a nerve person or a neurosurgeon. Because obviously some of these things can be brain or spine, you know, not everything's the nerves, but if it's a nerve, then it should be assessed by a nerve person, whether it's a plastic surgeon at your institution, a hand surgeon or a neurosurgeon because a lot of these things are treatable early on and really shouldn't be missed because it does impact patient care, right? In mm -hmm. outcomes. Like if you have a sharp lacerating injury that gets missed and it gets treated six months later, you know, that person needs a graft and then, and then they have a 50% chance of good outcome. So that's dramatically different than a 90% chance of a good outcome if you acutely repair it. So mm -hmm. that's the advice is be mindful of these things and and have a low threshold for cause calling neurosurgery or some nerve person if there's an unexpected neurological deficit in the context of a trauma, whether it's a brain lesion, spinal cord lesion, or a nerve lesion, these should, really shouldn't be missed because a lot of them are treatable acutely. Well, great. Thank you. I don't see any other questions, but that was a great summary. And so, uh, oh, I was going to say before is that, um, you know, I see so many of you Columbia people at, at Mount Sinai. My first thought is that... <laughs> you know, Columbia's taken over Mount Sinai, but I think a more accurate way of looking at it is Mount Sinai has kind of taken over Columbia using Columbia people. <laughs> I think that's the, just yeah. sucking up all the referring yeah. hospitals. So you guys yeah. are doing a pretty solid job there and you should be commended. Yeah. So um, it's, it's, it's a pleasure catching up with you guys. I'll see you, some of you at the meeting. I'm not going to the Dublin S, but I'm, I'll be at the CNS and uh, be fun to catch up and have a heater or two. Yeah. All right. 